Thanks for being here this evening. My name is Kevin Conover. I'm the host uh, for Educate for Life Radio. We're broadcasting in Southern California on K Praise 1210 AM uh, locally here, but all over the web. And uh, I hope you are uh, have been tuning in. We've had all kinds of fantastic guests. Last week, we were talking about archaeology in the Bible, all the evidence from archaeology that supports what the Bible has to say. And uh, one of the big questions that I had growing up was how could people live so long uh, you know, Methuselah living into the 900s, Adam living into the 900s. We've got all these records of historical people in the Bible living to incredibly long ages. And I, I was always a little jealous because I was like, man, I'd like to live that long. And uh, but let me uh, give you some interesting stats before we hop in here uh, with our guest. The average life expectancy currently around the world is somewhere right around 73 years old. Life expectancy has gone up from 47 years in 1950 to 73 today. The country with the longest lifespan, take a guess before I say it, the country with the longest lifespan is Hong Kong. I'm not sure why, but they are, they are it. 85 years old is the average life expectancy. The U.S. is ranked 46th in the world with about a 79-year life expectancy. Okay, here's another, here's another question for you if you're listening. See if you can guess how old... Um, the, the person living the longest lived uh, currently, um, how old they live to think, just, you know, think to yourself here, how long the answer is 122 years old. Oh my gosh. Jeannie Calment from France uh, was born in 1875 and just passed away recently in 1997. Whoa, what a life. Our oldest person living in the world today is Kane Tanaka from Japan. She is currently 119 years old. So I'm really curious about this subject. My guest today is Dr. Georgia Purdom. She holds a PhD in molecular genetics from Ohio State University. She served as an assistant and associate professor of biology at Mount Vernon Nazarene University. And she's currently the director of educational content at Answers in Genesis. She speaks and writes um, actively there. Answersingenesis.org, wonderful ministry. And uh, Dr. Purdom, thanks for being here today. Oh, thanks for having me. A absolutely. So um, is this real? Is this, uh, you know, people look at these, I, I'm, I'm a teacher, I teach apologetics uh, in a Christian high school, and my 12th graders, whenever we start talking about this, they're like, wait a second, Mr. Conover, is this like uh, an allegory here? Or what's going on? So in your view, did people really live this long? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because the Bible is true um, and we believe it in all of its parts um, and all of that it says, um, then yes, it is true because we can look at the genealogies, especially in Genesis chapter five and 11. And um, I always say, I'm not that great at math, but even I can add those things up and I can figure out uh, from that, the different lifespans, like you mentioned Methuselah at 969, Adam was 930. Um, and so we can definitely um, see that there's no, again, reason to doubt that those numbers are um, not true. Uh, just because we don't experience that today, there's lots of other things in the Bible that are obviously um, that we don't experience today either, like global floods and things like that, but they happened and because they're in the Bible. So, um, so we can definitely believe that from a, from a biblical perspective. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, so how did people live this long? I mean, uh, and, and that brings up a lot of other things. I mean, you're an expert in genetics. Um, what is it uh, along those same lines? What is it that causes certain organisms to be able to live so long. I, I know there are certain trees that have lived ridiculous. I think the oldest tree is somewhere around 5,000 years. They're, they're, the claim is uh, somewhere around there. And then there's, um, I heard there's a jellyfish that lives like almost to 200 years old. Are you familiar with that? Well, there are certain jelly. I know there's a certain type of jellyfish. Like if you, it can essentially be immortal in the oh, wow. sense that oh, wow. it can just generate, you know, um, new jellyfish from itself, like, you know, regeneration kind of not regeneration, but kind of in that sense where it cuts off, you know, certain parts of it and that part becomes a new jellyfish. Um, so they're immortal in that sense. Um, so that can happen. I don't know about jellyfish living 200 years old, but in the sense of maybe it just, you know, keeps on regenerating like that. Yeah. Um, so what, what is it that, that limits age, um, from a genetic perspective, what, what, what causes the cap? 
Right. So we're still trying to understand that completely. Um, but there's definitely, it's definitely not just one thing. There's mm. multiple things. So for example, um, it was back in the early 20th or well, mid 20th century that, um, we first discovered that cells do have a limit to how many times they can divide mm. and form new cells. Mm. Um, so that's called the Hayflick limit. Uh, named after Leonard Hayflick. And so it's only about 50 times that a cell can, can make copies of itself, so to speak, before it, it dies. It, they, so there's something limiting it. And um, some of it could be related to uh, what are called telomeres. So telomeres are um, basically the caps kind of on DNA. They are actual DNA sequence, but they usually occur on the ends of the chromosomes. And so um, without getting too technical on this, every time a chromosome makes a copy of itself, which is the DNA inside your cells, when it replicates, it doesn't go all the way to the ends. All right. So it's just because of the replication machinery, how it works. So every time that chromosome, a copy of it's made, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. So the Hayflick limit could be somehow related to that in the sense that obviously if you get the chromosomes too short, that's going to be a problem, right? Cause you're going to be getting into genes and important stuff that you don't want to, um, delete, <laughs> you yeah. don't want it to be missing. So the idea may be that as that gets shorter and shorter, it eventually gets to the point where it's so short that this cell triggers something called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, right? The cell just dies because it's no longer safe for it to continue in its current situation. Um, but the, with the chromosomes being too short. So that's, that may be one factor, at least from a, both a genetic and a cellular standpoint that limits how many times cells can make copies of themselves. That's interesting. And, and then, um, you know, dogs don't live nearly as long as people do. So, do they actually have a shorter, you know, uh, do their cells have a, sh a, a, a shorter ability to, to replicate before they run out? Like you were describing. I don't know. I don't know that anyone's actually ever studied that, um, to see why certain organisms have different lifespans. Um, mm. because we just don't, we don't understand everything that's involved in that. Um, yeah. you know, you also have, you're also having a lot of damage to your cells every day and your DNA every day because of things like UV light and pollutant, um, pollutants from the environment, things that you eat that um, may have things in them that aren't good for you. So you're constantly getting damage to your DNA. Mm. And so the body's response is we have amazing repair mechanisms that God has given us to try to repair that DNA. But sometimes that isn't possible. Sometimes those don't work like they're supposed to. Yeah. And that can lead to things like cancer, but it can also lead to things like cell death as well. Interesting. Okay, so back to the uh, biblical patriarchs and to, and to uh, the beginning of history here. Uh, what, what is the, uh, you know, from a, from a creation science perspective, what is the cur current theory as to why? I know that there's been a lot of history to this. Uh, I know at one time there was the canopy theory that said that there was extra oxygen in the air. And I think that's fallen on hard times. I think people have said that, that that's not. So what is the current theory uh, in regards to how people were able to live so long um, from a science perspective? Yeah, I think it's, it's not going to, we have models that we can develop to try to understand this, but we just have to understand that even though we know people live that long from a biological perspective, because we can't actually examine those people today, we're not going to know for sure. We're just going to look at how things are today and say, okay, so if this was different in the past, how could that have led to a longer life okay, yeah. span um, potentially for these people? So I think there's a number of factors. I think one thing we have to remember is that Adam and Eve's DNA was absolutely perfect when they were mm. created in the Garden of Eden. So they had no mutations until after the fall. So if you think about it, I mean, um, we really see lifespan start to decline after um, more rapidly after the uh, flood. And so if we kind of use that as sort of a uh, a point where things really started to go downhill, shall we say, um, 
it seems that maybe, you know, mutations were continuing to increase and accumulate um, over time. And so that's going to even maybe things like DNA repair mechanisms, they were perfect initially, yeah. but then if there were some mutations to them and they don't work exactly the way they should, um, it's possible that could have led to that decline, you know, from a, from a genetic standpoint, just the accumulation of mutations in the DNA. Um, you talked about a little bit about the canopy theory, which obviously, like you say, I don't know. I don't know of any creation scientists that still holds to that because just scientifically it doesn't work because you would have to have a pretty thick canopy, which then would create really high temperatures on the earth. And so that's one of the reasons that people don't hold to that anymore. Um, I think you have to remember too, as you go through time, you're going to get increasing um, pollution. I mean, even people back then are, are creating things that, you know, um, are going to pollute the world um, and start that process. Uh, you, so that's, that's one possibility. Um, the flood, I, th I think it's really interesting when you look at the flood because the world dramatically changed as a result of the flood. I yeah. mean, dramatically. Yeah. So I think there definitely is some tie in there with the fact that lifespans decreased dramatically after the flood. Um, okay. So the oldest recorded person after the flood is Eber and he was 464 years old. Um, and so he was pretty old. Now Noah lived to still be 900 and some. So, so obviously, you know, it wasn't like um, immediately that people started, you know, dying off sooner, but it, but it was a, a seemingly slow decline there, um, where now we're at, you know, hundred, you know, around a hundred or so, you know, like you mentioned, some people do get to be older, but not, not much above 120 usually, um, is the oldest now. Um, and so I think, Part of it is we've got a big population bottleneck at the time of the flood. So you go from however many people down to eight with three reproducing couples after the flood. So depending mm. on what their genetics were, that may have been part of it. They may just have not had whatever is needed from a genetic standpoint to live a long lifespan. So oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think population genetics is potential or, or genetic bottleneck, sorry, is one possibility for, we don't know again, what they ended up with, so to speak. I mean, all so of, something, of Noah. Mm -hmm. would that mean that something actually was cut out of the genetic pool that, um, added to the ability to live longer? Is that what you are uh, um, saying? I would say more, not so much that some, well, it depends on what you mean by cut out of the genetic pool. It's not that they're losing genetic information, so to speak, but maybe they're losing like genetic variety. So mm. like if you, if there's certain genes and there are a few genes, I was looking this up, um, that they studied that are gene variants, not genes themselves. Everybody should have the same number of genes barring, you know, some sort of deletion or something like that. Including Adam and Eve, they would have had the same number of genes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe there's any, there's any significant difference. Um, as far as their genes, um, which genes encode proteins. And so they're pretty important. Yeah. Um, there may have been differences in the DNA in between the genes. Um, and there may be, um, differences, you know, I mean, we've had 6,000 years of mutations, so, yeah, uh, that's a lot of hits on our, on our DNA, um, overall. So, but it's just variations from what they had. Um, so I don't believe it's changed significantly in that sense. So can I ask you a question about that? Cause I'm, um, I, I actually have a daughter, my, my middle daughter has cystic fibrosis. And so I got to talk to a geneticist. Well, they asked us to talk to a geneticist after she was born. And right. I asked some interesting questions and, and so forth, because I was trying to get a better grip on, on it. Um, so, and I've read, uh, Dr. Sanford's book on genetic entropy too. And, um, that's very interesting. The genetic decay curve. Um, right. I guess my question is, is, um, so when we say, you know, a point mutation took place, it's, it's detrimental to the, to the, uh, human genome, the, the body can't read the instruction manual as well, as far as I understand it, because the mutations are off. Um, so what does that look like as far as, um, when we, when we talk about genetics and we say this code is getting worse, 
are we are are we saying that there are there are more diseases that are coming about because of all the point mutations, meaning there's going to be more uh, diseases that are harmful to the utility of life. Is that what we're talking about? I mean, I think, yeah, that's definitely um, occurred. I, I think the reason, um, but at the same time, I would say that our DNA, I mean, if you look at Samford's work, like it basically shows we should all be dead by now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So how is it that we're still here? And it's because I think God created our genome to be extremely robust. Mm -hmm. So in the sense that we can take a lot of hits and be okay. I mean, not every mutation is going to be lethal or even a lot detrimental, you know, it could just be a little bit detrimental yeah. or maybe not have much effect at all. So I think, um, God has designed our DNA to be able to be like that. Otherwise, you know, like I say, we would have died out thousands of years ago. <laughs> we just yeah. wouldn't, we couldn't do that. So, um, so I definitely think, um, I, I definitely think the reason that we're seeing more disease, I think there's a couple possibilities. One is because we are degrading from a genetic standpoint. So we are going down, but also we're better at detecting disease. Um, sure. it's another reason I think we see an increase in that. Um, and so I think it's kind of twofold with that, but I do think it, it definitely is a degradation of the genome. I think that's why we see increasing like infertility and problems like that as well, just because it's just been a, it's been a, a thousands of years. And so it's just continuing to degrade. Um, and, and going back to the flood too, what I was going to say was, you know, the environment before and after, I mean, we had, we had dragonflies with like really big wingspans and we yeah. had some really big organisms <laughs> and we don't fully understand why. And so there could have been some environmental things that were different, not a canopy, but something with the environment that may have been, it seems like it was milder, you know, that we didn't have the extremes like we have today. So um, it may have been different and that may have affected um, individuals, mm. you know, to the sense of allowing them to live longer. I'm not saying we understand what that is, but that's one, that's another possibility. That's interesting. Um, is the, is the secular world, you know, from a science perspective, I, and I don't know, um, if you, if you've if you, uh, looked into this at all, but you know, everybody's always talking about like, we want to live longer. We want to live longer. We want to, because of course we have the hope of heaven and, and spending eternity with Christ. And, uh, and, but, but for somebody who doesn't know the Lord and, and, you know, is very much fearful about what happens next, there's constantly the hunt for the fountain of youth. Um, right. is there any science that, you know, of currently where they're trying to, you know, they're trying to advance years through some other method in, in genetics or, or uh, biology? Well, I think they're always looking for ways to extend life. Like they, they're always trying to figure out what causes us to age. So one of the things, for example, is, uh, free radicals. So mm -hmm. these are atoms that are missing an electron. So they try to steal them from other things, which then hurts, you know, those particular elements and those things. So, um, and that affects like, um, we do make a lot of free radicals in our bodies through different processes through in our cells, especially our mitochondria, which are the little power factories in our cells. So that's why we eat things that have antioxidants in them because mm. they, they kind of absorb up those free radicals. And so that's good. Uh, so the, because it's still kind of a mystery as to why we age. I mean, we know that our cells have limits and, but we don't understand all the factors around that. So they're always looking for that quote unquote fountain of youth um, yeah. to try to figure that out. Because like you say this, especially I think with this pandemic, it showed us that people are, are really fearful of death. They are oh, yeah. really, really fearful of it. And, um, and so, but they haven't really, and in some ways from an evolutionary standpoint, it doesn't really make sense why people live as long as they do, because after your reproductive years are over from an evolutionary standpoint, what are you doing? You're a drain on, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying people are, but I'm saying yeah. from an evolutionary perspective, how do you get around that? Like you're not reproducing yourself. So what's the point? And so they've even come up with things like the grandmother effect where they would say, oh, well, older people help raise younger people. They help raise their grandchildren. They help, you know, give wisdom to their grandchildren or help them. So that's why they're still around. But really from an evolutionary perspective, it doesn't really make any sense actually why we live as long as we do. Um, because it doesn't that's seem like it would be helpful. 
Yeah. 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 And I was thinking about this too. Um, evolution teaches that everything uh, started out worse and has gotten progressively better. Whereas the Bible says everything started out perfect and has mm-hmm. gotten progressively worse. And it's interesting how contradictory the worldviews are. And yet mm-hmm. it seems to support the biblical worldview, not, not the evolutionary ideas. A hundred percent. Yeah. We're definitely not um, getting better and better. We're, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, I mean, it, it's always interesting to see how they can try to explain these things to come up with these things to, um, to explain why it's going against what, what they would expect. Um, and so anyways, but you know, there's, there's even, I was going to mention, there are some genes. So they have done studies on centurions, which are people that have lived to be at least a hundred years old. And they have looked for, are there certain genetic variants of certain genes that are more common in centurions than in other people? Um, and to try to find that, what you were talking about, that, you know, fountain of youth, like from a genetic standpoint, like, is there a gene you could say that, you know, Hey, if you have this version of the gene, you're going to live a really long time. Um, and there have been a few genes that they found. Um, and I'm just looking at a book for reference or remember what they are. Um, one is, um, uh, apolipoprotein, let's see, is it E yeah. APOE gene. Um, it helps them in the regulation of cholesterol. So certain variants of that are found in centurions. So obviously, you know, if you can process that better and probably not have as high a cholesterol, you're probably going to live longer. Um, there's another one, insulin growth factor one, which has to do with cell proliferation and, um, cell death is another one. They found certain variants of in centurions and super, this is a big one, super oxide dismutasis, <laughs> which is a big term. <laughs> um, they're just important in breakdown of agents that damage DNA. So if you have certain of those enzymes that are working better at taking away those agents that hurt the DNA, then you're going to live longer probably, you know? Um, so yeah. they have done some genetic research and they do know there are certain variations of genes that we do find more commonly in people that live longer than others but not one of them. It's not like some singular fountain of youth. It's probably a multiplicity of things that are leading to Mm. people living these really long lives. And another reason too, you can see that is you can have people that live to be a hundred and I'm not saying people should do this, but they smoke every day. Yeah. They they drink a lot. And you're like, how do these people live to be a hundred? Right. And I always say, genetics, they've got, there's certain things they have that are somehow decreasing the effects of those things on their bodies and allowing them to live longer. Yeah. That's interesting. And so, um, what would be the difference in, you know, Adam and I was, when I was talking to this geneticist, I, uh, we were, she was, she was explaining to me about cystic fibrosis, how on a particular it was a, it was a particular mutation. I mean, they could identify it exactly. I mean, oh, they yeah. knew the exact one and, um, which was pretty, pretty amazing. And I said, uh, she said, we all have tons of mutations in our bodies. And, um, she just happens to have these show up on both, I guess it's both chromosomes. And, mm-hmm. um, that's why it manifested, even though my wife and I were carriers. And I said to her, well, that's really interesting. I said, I said, do you know of any good, uh, beneficial mutations? Because this was obviously a bad mutation. And she said, no, actually I don't. But she said, she said, there's gotta be some, because that's how we evolved. And, uh, I went, oh yeah, well, you know, that's why I don't believe in evolution. And I think she paused and was like, oh, you know, it's one of these guys. So, (laughs) so she tried to change the subject, but then I said, I said, what would it be like if you had a person who had no mutations, would they be really healthy or really unhealthy? And she said, Oh, that's an interesting question. She said, you know, I assume they would probably be really healthy. And I just thought, Oh my goodness, this is like, (laughs) you know, I wish I had recorded this, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but, um, do you see when, when you're out and about talking to to people about this and, uh, and, and, and I don't know if you've had these conversations, but you're talking to somebody who maybe isn't a Bible believing Christian, Um, is there a lot of conflict between the secular worldview and genetics and the biblical worldview, or are you seeing people that are going, well, no, the conclusions we're coming to are very similar to what you're coming to. I would say, I mean, I don't have a lot of conversations with those people because they don't want to talk to me. Um, but (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> um, but I would say just from reading their research papers and, and the information that they're putting out. So it's really interesting. Once in a while, they'll, you'll see people um, come along and be really honest about it in the mm. evolutionary community. And they'll publish papers and you just read them and you're like, yeah, they know this is a major problem. Yeah. And so let me give you a really good example of that. Um, it's from one of my, one of my favorite papers. It was published uh, in the, in the early two thousands, I think. And so um, it was in a, you know, well-respected scientific journal. And they were trying to explain how evolution occurs. Like you would need something that gives you gain of information, um, genetic information, but all you ever see is loss. And I'm like, yeah, so yeah. you've got a major problem, right? So how do you explain it? So the whole paper, well, most of the paper focuses on natural selection. And it's like, okay, that's nice, but that doesn't explain how you get from microbes to man. That only explains how you get different butterfly wings or different stickleback fish. It doesn't explain how you get from a butterfly to a fish. Okay. Let's just, you know, you know what I'm saying? You're not yeah. explaining these big changes that you need to explain. And so they recognize that. And they actually say towards the end of the paper, well, you know, this is what we really need to explain, but we don't really have any good examples of it. So mm. then, and this just blew me away. They're like, maybe it's just a matter of semantics. And I'm like, how? No, semantics is just renaming of things. It's not, it's more than just wordplay here. And so they said, maybe basically, instead of thinking of it as like a fly that's lost what are called trichomes. Okay. So rather than calling it the loss of trichomes, we'll call it the gain of naked cuticle. And I'm like, well, you can call it whatever you want, but it doesn't change what it is. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like if someone lost all their money, okay? Instead of saying I'm poor, they say I've gained poverty. Well, <laughs> okay, that doesn't change your financial situation, yeah. um, but makes you sound happier and better about it, but it doesn't change it. And so I thought they are resorting to this. Like, this is what you have to resort to. It, renaming it might make you feel better, but it ultimately yeah. doesn't change anything about it. And yeah. so it just shows you like the extremes in some ways that they're willing to go to because they know it's a problem. They just have, they just don't know how to handle it. Interesting. That's very interesting. Um, so another question I had too is, when it comes to, um, you know, variation within races and uh, different nationalities all over the world, and we go all the way back to Adam and Eve, um, can you explain uh, um, what is different about Adam and Eve that they're able to, and, and maybe even Noah and his kids, um, what is different about their genetics that they're able to generate all the different races, but my wife and I, you know, we can't make a variety of races. It, it, are we, would, would, if you travel down the line of our ancestry, right? Um, are we, are my wife and I, would we actually be able to, do we have within us the genetic ability to generate tons of different races? Or is that only something that people farther back in history were able to do because they had more variety within their genetics? I would say, yes, B. So you're not able to, but the people back then would have been able more to. And, and, and even, okay. So first of all, I would not say there are multiple races. There's only one race um, mm. because it's the human race come from Adam and Eve. There's yeah. different ethnicities or people groups um, that we have today. So um, I think that God created he, well, he had to have created Adam and Eve with a lot of genetic diversity because we see that in all, like you say, all these ethnic, ethnic groups that we have today, we see that, but you, but it really depends on the parents and what their genetic variety is, because you hmm. can actually even observe this today to some degree. So for example, um, I've seen pictures of, um, parents who are both kind of middle Brown, um, in their skin shade. And they had, they had twin daughters, okay, fraternal twins. And one was very dark skin, very dark hair, very dark eyes. The other had very light skin, very light hair, and very light eyes. Now, they're sisters, but they cannot look any different. Mm, um, they're yeah. sometimes called black, white twins. And so that's because their parents were, because they're somewhere in the middle, so to speak, in their skin shade, it means they have 
some genes that code for lots of melanin, which produces darker skin, and some genes that code for not a lot of melanin, and that codes for that gives the lighter skin. So because they had that variety in themselves, um, their one daughter got a lot of the genes that code for a lot of melanin, and the other gene, their other daughter got the opposite of that. So you can actually observe it today. Um, but, uh, but you have to have parents that already are starting out with some of that genetic variety. Uh, mm. there's, there's lots of examples. You can have, um, for example, uh, a very, I've seen pictures of a very dark father and a very light mother, and they have the black white twins. I've seen that same situation produce children that were every one of them was in the middle, um, Brown, you know, so, um, you, it's kind of a roll of the genetic dice to a degree, um, that depending on what you, um, get, uh, but I think that Adam and Eve, um, especially when it comes to even like things like skin shade and eye shape and all of that had the, had the potential to produce those different ones. And really the, the event that occurred after the flood, about a hundred years after the flood with the tower of Babel, it's really yeah. that event when God separated, confused the language and people spread out. Well, then you get like all these tiny little gene pools all over the world and you get them only, you know, marrying and having children within those groups. And so whatever DNA they took with them for whatever traits is going to be dominant then. And so you get the almond shaped eyes in Asia, you get the darker skin in Africa, you get the lighter skin in Europe. Now there may be other factors as well, but I think most of it comes from just the genetic variety that they took with them when they went to those places. So is it feasible that you could actually have a couple that had as much genetic variety within them today as Adam and Eve had originally? Is that feasible or no? I don't think so. I don't think that would be possible because, well, first of all, because we've lost stuff. I mean, you've got a major population bottleneck at the time of the flood. Um, so I would think some of that variety was probably a lot of that variety was lost at that point. Um, and you just don't have it anymore. Um, Mm. and a lot of it's just been affected over time by mutations and things. So I, I don't think we could have that variety in any single couple or person today. Um, just cause it's changed too much over time. And then do you think that there is actually, um, I mean, you know, getting into God's mind, is there a reason that he, you know, obviously this is something that he was, he's was well aware of, um, what, what is, and I don't know if that there's anything in the scripture that actually teaches us why he did it this way. Do you think that he had a particular reason why he allowed the lifespans to decrease the way he has? Um, I can't really answer that question. I don't know. I I think a lot of it is probably just biological, you know, genetic or environmental. Um, I think one of the things we have to realize, I think there was probably a lot more disease after the flood, Mm -hmm. uh, with things like, um, pathogenic bacteria, you know, bacteria that cause disease because, there's a major, you know, like I say, a major reshaping of the earth at that time. And so a lot of times what we're finding, cause I like to look at bacterial genetics is we find that they like, they're perfectly fine. Like the, the bacteria that causes cholera. Okay. Vibrio cholera. It's perfectly fine when you just leave it in the water <laughs> and no. it actually produces enzymes and does things that breaks down, um, exoskeletons of other creatures. So it's doing good things but then you put it in a human being and it's bad. Right. Mm. And so it's a, what we call displacement, you know, it's not, it's not in the area that it was originally created to be in. It's found its way into other environments and other areas and it's caused problems. Um, we blame it on the bacteria, but honestly, they're just trying to survive. Um, and so, uh, but it just happens to have really bad side effects for us when they're in us. So, uh, so I think some of that could have, I think, you know, some of that could have happened as a result of the flood where you have a displacement and you have bacteria and other microorganisms ending up where they shouldn't. And so there's there's water all over the earth. So it's, it's moving Mm -hmm. things all over the place. Right. Everything's moving everywhere in places where, and so, you know, to adapt and survive in a fallen world and a post flood world, some of these organisms may have, you know, um, have things that while it helps them in the environment they're in, if they end up in a different environment, like a human being or an animal, it causes disease. So I think that's another factor that may have led to, um, decrease in lifespan. It could also be the fact that 
I think plant life could be, I mean, different after the flood. I mean, Mm. we don't know what we lost as a result of the flood. Um, so it could have been different and that could have been a problem, um, after the flood. So there, you know, there's a lot of what ifs, I guess, and it's good to think about those things, but I think it's probably not just one thing. I think it's multiple things. Oh, that makes sense. Huh? Interesting. Do you know if there are, are, are there any creationist uh, scientists that are, um, studying genetics, uh, heavily currently, like, uh, looking at the cutting edge of genetics is the answers in Genesis working on anything in particular where they're trying to understand genetics better. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Nathaniel Jenison, who works for us, he's a Harvard trained geneticist and he just, he's done a lot of research in this area, um, looking at mutations and, um, how they affect individuals, but also from the sense of he's really into, um, like mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam Mm, mm. and, um, really tracing back lineages. Um, so he just released a brand new book called traced and traced what it's doing is it's taking the Y chromosome information that we have on males all over the world and really trying to understand from the populations that we have today, how we all go back to those that lived several thousand years ago uh, and really showing, you know, kind of some of these events in history, not just the, like Tower of Babel, but even the slave trade, um, how that you can, you can see these things genetically um, wow. certain, you know, when this, this country took over this country and, you know, those individuals start marrying and having offspring. And, and so he's been able to do a lot of really good research on that. And he's still continuing to do that. Um, but his book uh, talks a lot about that. And, you know, we all, like the world population, I was talking to someone about this the other day, was actually really small for a long time. Yeah. So we were marrying very close, well, I mean, in some ways, very close relatives, because that was all that was available. Um, And so, you know, those ancestry tests they have, I'm always like, eh, it really doesn't tell you a whole lot. Yeah. Because <laughs> it doesn't go back very far. You know, honestly, there's only so much you can tell. Um, And it doesn't go, it's not going to tell you where you're you know, whatever ancestors thousands of years ago came from. It just can't do that. You can't detect that, so to speak, in the types of testing that they're doing. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I know a lot of people, they, they take those tests and they're like, Whoa, I'm not as much of this nationality as I thought I was. (laughs) And, uh, -hmm. it's pretty interesting. Um, so, and then he, so he's tracing back and, um, what is his objective in, in tracing back those, those genetics, uh, you said, you know, back to the tower of Babel and then mitochondrial Eve, is that, is that science, um, establishing that the Bible is actual history, historical record. Is that what that's doing? Yeah. Yeah. Some of it is. And some of it's just showing that these things can't be hundreds of thousands of years old. You can't mm. have human populations that are that old or had that many people. Like they, like they would say, oh, humans evolved out of a population of about 10,000 or so people a few hundred thousand years ago. And he's showing that's just impossible. There's no way that could be true. You know, you have to look at things like mutation rates. You have to look mm. at all of that and say, there's just no way it would be mutated to kingdom come, you know, and we wouldn't, there's no way we would still be functioning individuals. So because of the uh, amount yeah, of mutations, so, we would be, our genetics would be so overrun with mutations that we wouldn't, we wouldn't even be able to survive. Right. Right. And he, he's really trying to show that there, that if you start with the Bible, you are making certain, um, testable scientific claims mm. that, So, and showing you can test them, you can test these things, you can observe them, you can repeat it, you know, using the scientific method. Um, And that is something that evolutionists, I think, have always challenged us with is, Mm. can you, you know, even though the same is true for them, um, you have to make something that's testable, you have to make a testable claim um, in order to use the scientific method, something you can observe and look at in the present to show does it support or not support what you believe about the past. And so that's really what he's trying to do is develop these these models, testable models and ideas. So we can show that indeed um, what we see in science today support or confirms what the Bible says. That's great. Yeah. I actually had an atheist say that once time to me, he, he was like, what, what claims do creation scientists ever make that could actually be put to the test and then proven to be true? 
And I'm kind of like, well, the Bible is the whole thing. I mean, everything in the Bible is a claim about reality. And right. so honestly, there's numerous things that you could, you could do that with. Oh, we do that. We do that in geology. We do that in, uh, so in Dr. Andrew Snelling, our geologist just recently published some papers on work that he did uh, on uh, folds that are in the Grand Canyon. So those folds had to have been made. Each layer, they would say, is millions of years old. The evolutionists would say, there's no way you can get that bend in the rock if those are each millions of years old. There's, they all had to be there at one time and bend when it was still soft and pliable to look like that. Yeah. So Dr. Snelling has done like microscopic work on the grains that are in that to show that they are in, that's indeed, you know, what had to have happened. And so it's just amazing. There's, I always get irritated when people say, you know, well, creation scientists just say God did it. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, because God did it. We are, we can study it. It's logical. He's a logical only God. And so our desire is to study it and understand it because of that. Yeah. That's wonderful. I know. I love it. I, when I teach my students, you know, I, I tell them all the time, uh, the evidence is overwhelming for the truth of the Bible and the truth of Christianity. Uh, I, I couldn't walk away from it unless I blatantly ignored the evidence because there is just so much evidence to support it from every, every different scientific field. It's incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um, it really well, isn't. I try to help people understand it's a reasoned faith. You know, it's not blind. Christianity is a reasoned faith. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, if you're just tuning in, my guest uh, this evening has been uh, Dr. Georgia Purdom, and she's with Answers in Genesis. If you uh, want to look more into this, there are thousands of articles that uh, Answers in Genesis has that, that, that deal with uh, pretty much every scientific field, every aspect, every question you could possibly imagine, including the one about uh, how could people live that long. And um, I think I, I, from what I've read, secular science is demonstrating the truth of what the Bible says historically happened with the long ages. Um, we're seeing it in genetics uh, as well as many other fields. Before before we um, close up here, uh, Dr. Purdom, I wanted to say, is there any extra biblical evidence for the, um, the, the idea that uh, people lived much longer in the past? Is there anything that uh, corroborates that? Simple, we'll refer to the Sumerian king list, um, which has ages for different kings as being, um, now, they're, they're super inflated. <laughs> they're, they're much older. I mean, they're like 10,000 years, or they're, you know, they're, they're not necessarily correct, but um, it, but it shows that people had these ideas that people could I mean, the Sumerian king list, people say, oh, that came before the Bible. No, it didn't. It, it was after, you know, it was after those part, portions of scripture were written. But um, and the Sumerian king list may be borrowing those ideas from the Bible in the sense of giving, assigning people long ages. And it may show that, you know, when they see, saw these people living long ages, they might have thought of them as gods. Mm. You know, I mean, today, if we had, we knew somebody that had lived 900 years. Yeah. I mean, we'd just be like, what? Like, yeah. how is that possible? You know, is this person ever going to die? You know, and so they may have ascribed certain attributes to them that weren't necessarily weren't gods, obviously, but, you know, because of that. So there is some things in archaeology that would show that people at least, you know, had this like, experience or idea that people were living long periods of time. Oh, so that's one other real quick question here before we, we go out uh, that I've, that I've had is, um, is it possible that there are certain people that lived very long while other people's lifespans dropped off? Um, so, so maybe fewer and fewer, fewer people lived long and other people's gradually, but, but you had a few people that were living long. Is that, how would that work genetically? It's possible. I mean, it depends on the lineages that you have. So if they, if they tended to have um, certain gene genetic variants that, you know, were promoting of that long life, it's possible, or depending on, you know, how well they took care of themselves, what they ate, you know, being careful of that and how they lived their lives. Um, 
Uh, it's possible that you could have had some that were living longer than others. I mean, when we say even, you know, Eber is the longer, longest recorded, and that was almost 500 years old. Um, that's nothing to, you know, that's still a really long time. And yeah. Um, and, you know, so Noah's, you know, so they were still, I mean, it wasn't really that short. Um, so it still would be pretty incredible to see that, especially if some people were starting to go downhill, you know, or go decrease their lifespan pretty much quicker than others. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been really interesting. Thank you so much for being on the program this evening. Uh, really sure, enjoyed your pleasure. time. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And everything you're doing with Answers in Genesis. For those of you listening, uh, please make sure you check out answersingenesis.org. If you haven't been to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, um, uh, everybody raves about it. It's incredible and uh, just really brings to life a lot of what we read about in the Bible and it shows you how it's feasible, um, that this isn't just uh, a story. This is actual real history. So um, check it out. And um, thank you for being with us. We'll be back again next week. I've got some exciting interviews coming up, um, in, including uh, a Catholic organization that actually um, are believe in a recent creation and a six-day creation. It's not something you hear about often, but I uh, met somebody recently who is working in, within the Catholic Church to teach um, that the Bible means what it says and says what it means back in Genesis 1 and 2. So um, stay with us. We'll, we'll be here again next week. And uh, looking forward to uh, being with you again. God bless you and have a great evening.